folks, uh, well, let's, if you please uh, take a seat. I want to actually tell you that uh, the moderator of the panel, Eric Johansson, is a true great hero. I, how long ago? What is it? Two weeks ago, he had back surgery. Do you hear that, folks? Back surgery. And he's up here for the first time at a public event with us. So a big hand for Eric Johansson of Sunni Maritime, of Tumbo fame, and four or five other uh, points of fame that, uh, and again, if you're Jason, you're out there, come on up, otherwise we'll get started. All right. Eric, take it away with your panel. efforts uh, in securing federal grant monies uh, to support our harbor. Uh, today's discussion is on weights, rough waters, and uh, what to do. Uh, the harbor here, as you can see, and uh, I have to tell you right now, I've been here since 9 this morning when I arrived, and uh, I don't think we rocked at all today, so uh, maybe a little. Uh, but yeah, it is a concern. Weights are definitely uh, something that uh, has to be discussed. Uh, our panel today uh, consists of uh, mariners, uh, marinas, and, uh, uh, and the United States Coast Guard. And uh, I think what we'll see today is that uh, it is a concern for all of us. Uh, I have to tell you, a few years ago, the training ship at Carter State, which is our state's training ship at Maritime College, uh, made a trip up to uh, the Port of Albany. Uh, it was, I think, about 10, 12 years ago. It was the last trip it ever made. Uh, and the reason why was because of weights. And uh, it wasn't anything that the training ship had done uh, incorrectly. It was mostly that uh, a parent of one of the cadets uh, decided to follow the ship up to the port and race around the boat. Well, of course, as they went by every mariner, it threw a weight. Uh, but what do everyone see? They see what first? The largest vessel. And uh, as a result, the Empire State uh, you know, had a lot of uh, issues with that and uh, just decided it wasn't worth it to go back up there again. Uh, so, I think what we'll find today is that uh, there are some things that can be done to help that out and uh, uh, we'll start our panel discussion today. I would believe I would like to start today with... Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, Commander Sturgis. Uh, uh, Linda's been in the port now for two years and uh, we'll start with the Coast Guard's view on Good morning everybody. Uh, can you hear us okay? In the back of the bridge, all right, great. Uh, first of all, I think I'd like to uh, put some clarification on one of the questions that Manisha received about uh, gasoline coming from commercial vessels. Uh, gasoline shouldn't be coming from any vessel. So uh, it doesn't matter commercial or not. So, so for the paddler that asked that question, um, there's a reason why they're called fuel tanks. Um, so if for some reason you see a sheen, just like Manisha said, you can call uh, DEC, you can call 911, or you can call the Coast Guard National Response Center our two agencies will definitely um, adhere to it. Uh, another thing to echo on the last panel, when Manisha mentioned about the uh, storm drain, uh, you know, the sewage discharge and the, the work that New York State started to do about uh, improving the holding for rainwater, another big issue that, uh, that, that we have collectively as sister agencies is, uh, you know, a lot of the pollution comes from roads, you know, uh, tires, you know, on roads. Uh, just, you know, people's, you know, uh, I hate to say their car gas tanks, well, they don't leak usually, they'll blow up, but, um, you know, like will from cars dripping, when there's a major rain, uh, both of our agencies are chased and what we call Mr. Sheens all over. So, um, so I would like to applaud the state on that. That's a, that's a great initiative that's going to help, um, you know, really the, the, for the environment, the quality of the water in general. So, waste. Um, I would get one thing out there uh, with the United States Coast Guard. So what does that mean? The Coast Guard is in charge of enforcing regulations on the federal navigable waters. Uh, what are we sitting on right now? A federal navigable water. Uh, one thing about this region, uh, there are no federal wake zones in, in New York or New York City, New Jersey, the combined New, New Jersey, New, Jer New York port area. Um, there, there's only one speed zone and wake zone and it's on a Harlem River and that's actually a state regulation. So a lot of times we've been called um, by, by certain, some, certain concerned voters going, hey, Coast Guard, what can you do about someone that just waked me? And I hate to say this, but if it's not in the federal law, 
as a federal government, we can't enforce a law we can't enforce. It'd be the equivalent of a, a state trooper coming on someone's cornfield and arresting the John Deere tractor driver. You know, we just can't do it. It, it would be inappropriate for us from a, in a jurisdiction. But safety is still very important. So what do we do to help prevent it and mitigate it? Every time we get a call by somebody, it could be uh, you know, someone that owns a private boat, it could be a commercial vessel, it could be another uh, government agency that says, hey, you know, boat X just waked me. Um, if, it's, if it's a commercial company, what we do as a Coast Guard, because of our close relationship with our working partner, because we have the most professional mariners in the world here in New York, and I can tell you that by the amount of accidents we did not respond to last year, um, we call it and we have a courtesy discussion. And that usually goes a long way. So with that, um, I'll definitely answer a lot of the questions when they come across the panel, but I wanted to kind of set that because I do get a lot of questions, what's the Coast Guard doing about it? But because of the, the authority jurisdiction statutorily, we really can't. Um, how can you improve that? There's always your congressman, but we'll get into that discussion a little bit. Okay, Linda. Uh, so that's the Coast Guard's perspective on weeks. And then next we have uh, on our panel is Scott Seisel. Uh, he's the manager of the Chelsea Marina, right uh, within shouting distance of us here. And uh, he has, I'm sure, a lot of issues uh, with uh, the wakes uh, as a uh, marina. And uh, here, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. As he says, uh, I work and we run the Chelsea Piers Marina. I've been here since 99 and I've watched the harbor change quite a bit. Uh, it was a lot different back when I first started, and now it's changed significantly. We're trying to protect ourselves the best we can from the wakes with attenuating systems, and, but we, we still have yet to find something that works. Everything that we've done has failed. And, uh, we are taking on a lot of damage, and I think a lot of other marinas are in the same boat as we're in. Um, I just, you know, I'm at a loss for what to do, you know. Uh, I think we, with better cooperation with the ferry service and stuff like that, maybe going towards the center of the river, not coming so close to the marinas, would help too. Um, just being better neighbors and helping each other out. Again, we're working on systems that can help better protect us, but right now it's getting uh, a little scary because uh, I get a lot of complaints from my customers and from boaters about you know even walking the docks and getting injured and something like that. So again, we're trying the best we can to work with everyone to help find a solution, but it's just, we're not there yet, and it's, uh, but we're trying very hard. Uh, refer, uh, does the Chelsea Piers have any uh, surge or weight attenuation systems at all set up? We, we did. Right now, we're very vulnerable because the one we had in place failed. So we're trying to redesign a new one, and I've been talking with engineering companies and dock manufacturers, and we're trying to figure something out. Also, some of the issues we're having is permitting, too. You're only allowed to do certain things, and certain things you can do and you can't do, which makes it difficult to protect ourselves, too. I'll be talking to you later. <laughs> so, but that's it. <laughs> I got security waiting for you, though. <laughs> so that, that's one of the things I think if we could, if we could Get, some of, get over some of those uh, permitting issues, we can build better things that can better protect ourselves and make a safer marina for everyone. Yeah, for you, uh, those of you that are not uh, familiar with it, uh, you know, when you build a marina on uh, uh, you know, a highway as uh, the Hudson River is, uh, and, and you have uh, wakes that are going to be uh, coming, just like that vessel went up the Hudson River, uh, if you don't have uh, proper weight attenuation systems, uh, you will have weight issues. And, uh, this is uh, a problem that I'm sure that you would like to see resolved. Uh, and then the second to that would be the surge attenuation systems, uh, which is what's under the water. The weights will be on the top, so uh, that, that's a, another topic altogether. But uh, we'll stick it to the topic of, uh, of weights. Uh, um, so we've got the uh, perspective of our regulators and, uh, of course, of our marinas. And, uh, our last uh, panelist today will be Captain Andrew McGovern uh, from the San Diego Pilots as a mariner's perspective of uh, weights. Uh, you know, Captain McGovern has sit on, uh, uh, on the chair of the Harbor Safety Committee and uh, has been an active uh, participant in uh, safety in the Port of New York. And uh, I'm 
sure you all probably even recognize him he's become so famous. Uh, yeah. So, Captain McGovern. Uh, thanks, Eric. And uh, well, I want to thank you for putting on this uh, conference yesterday and today. This is great. And uh, at the same time, uh, this is all Roland's fault because we are a product of our own success. The, uh, the Blue Highway system, uh, the ferry resurgence. Uh, last year we didn't have too many complaints about waste on the East River, and now we've got a ferry system on the East River, and now we're getting complaints on the East River. So, um, uh, but as Scott said, uh, you know, the best wake attenuators are solid, uh, let's say a rock wall would be the best. And unfortunately, uh, you know, Catch-22, sorry, you can't build one. Uh, so, uh, you know, we will, uh, I, I talked to Manisha a little bit about it yesterday, and she is going to start looking into this. Uh, and she just took over there, so we can't blame about her, it's her predecessors. But anyway, uh, that is, you know, it's Catch-22. When, when you build a facility, as Eric said, on a, on, a, on a waterway, you are responsible for building it to those conditions that are presently out there. And that includes traffic, so you, you need to build it to those conditions. You can't expect the conditions to change, obviously, just because you built a marina. The catch-22 is, I'm sorry, you can't get the permit to do what you need to do. So uh, hopefully that will um, be worked out uh, as we go down the road. Um, Scott, uh, excuse me, Eric did say, you know, a lot of times what happens is when you've got a number of vessels out in the river and uh, then a wake hits, hits a marina or, or a boat, they look out and the biggest, the biggest vessel out there, they assume that's the one it came from and they're the ones they report. But a lot of times, uh, large vessels have displacement holes, they don't throw a large wake. They, they do not. I mean, a lot of times it's the smaller vessels that are out there that's, that throw the bigger wakes. What the larger vessels do, and this is a lot of times mistaken for a wake, as Eric just mentioned, is there is surge. There is, you can imagine you take a 100,000 ton dead weight vessel and you move it through the water. That's displacing 100,000 tons of water. Now, so take 100,000, multiply it by 2,000, and that's how many pounds of water. You know, you're up to billions of pounds of water that, you know, they won't divide that by seven, you got the amount of gallons. But basically, you know, when a ship goes through the water, you know, it creates a hole, and that water's got to go somewhere, so it goes out. Then after the ship passes by, there's a huge hole and it leaves. Now that water's got to go back in. So that combination of displacing the water out and then that water having to fill the hole as it passes through creates a surge. And this is just physics. It doesn't matter how fast the vessel, the vessel could be going slow, could be going fast. This is still going to happen. But and a lot of people mistake the surge for a wake. In fact, the surge can probably do more damage than, uh, than a wake can, especially in the narrow waterway. It's not as prevalent in the, east, in the, in the North River because of the, south, the, the width of the river and the depth. It's more uh, prevalent in narrower um, waterways or shallower waterways. You can have a large open space, but if it's shallow, this can still happen. We have some real problems down in, uh, on Staten Island and even in, into the Rockaways uh, from surge from passing vessels. It could be a mile away, uh, but that is an issue that, again, has to be mitigated. That one, I think it's going to be a harder lift than the, uh, than the wake problem. Um, one of the other issues with uh, wakes, uh, you see some of the vessels out here will throw a larger wake, some will throw what looks like a smaller wake. Uh, they built, uh, in response to this, some of the ferries and, and other uh, small cargo vessels went to a low wake design. And after uh, studying these for a while, they found out, yes, the wake is, is a lower wake, but unfortunately, um, it's a more powerful wake, and the erosion uh, caused by these vessels is much greater than the larger wake vessels. So now we're balancing, okay, do we, do we have a vessel that throws a wake, or do we have a vessel that erodes, let's say, Jamaica Bay or, or somewhere like that. So it's always a balance on these, and uh, as 
Ms. Eric said, I chair the Harbor Safety Committee. We do have a passenger vessel subcommittee, and with both uh, the operators, the state of New Jersey, um, and EDC, they have uh, put together, um, they're actually working on, it's not quite done yet, but they're working on a best practice that will, they're trying to redefine their routes to, uh, to run as far away from the marinas as possible. When possible. Unfortunately, some of the terminals are built close to marinas. I had uh, uh, a tenant over at the Lincoln Harbor Marina who came up to me during one of these meetings and complained that you know, she can basically set her watch um, uh, by the, uh, you know, when her boat's going to start rocking and when it's going to stop rocking because of when the ferry's running. And I asked her why she didn't move down to you know, the State Park Marina or somewhere like that. And she said, well, because I think. So it's a, uh, you know, again, it's, it's a balance. Um, you know, ferries, you know, if they slow down to, to five knots, then they're not going to be able to keep their schedule. There'll be a problem there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's something that we're just going to have to uh, keep working on. Hopefully this, uh, this new best practice is being worked on will help. And uh, we'll see what uh, goes on from there. With that, I'll turn it back to Eric. Thank you, uh, Andrew. And uh, okay, well, uh, we have now uh, a, a very vocal uh, captain, uh, Jason Reimer, uh, and uh, he'll give the perspective of, as you can hear what Captain Governor was saying uh, earlier, was that uh, there were no uh, issues on each.
Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Jack Bevins, I'm the uh, Director of Operations with the Sea Street Ferry. Um, one of the key tools that we use to uh, reduce wakes, uh, we perform a wake wash uh, route assessments on all of our uh, routes, and we work closely with the captains and uh, local facilities um, to try and uh, come up with the best possible or the practical route to, uh, to reduce wakes you know, um, along the waterfront within the, uh, within the harbor. Necessary tools and information um, to operate the boats um, in a safe and effective manner to uh, reduce weights and uh, still maintain our operating schedules. Okay, uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions here. I read through them, they're good questions. Um, and uh, maybe not that one, that was Ray. Here comes this question. All right, I knew we had it. Okay, uh, we'll start with the first one here. Under the coal rigs, does going fast enough cause dangerous or damaging wakes amount to unsafe navigation? So, Commander Sturgis, would you like to answer that one? I sure understand. So, the question is regarding coal rigs and speed. Ooh, um, kind of in my opening statement. There's uh, There are no speed restrictions. So, that's uh, a hard one to enforce so that the Try and drive, draw parallel to coal rigs and speed. Really, um, you know, being a prudent uh, um, mariner is really what it's all about. So, um, if, if the question is really alluded to speed limits, um, that's uh, part of the answer. Since already, would anyone else like to say something? Um, right now, as Linda said, there is no federal um, or state law in, in here prohibiting uh, as far as speed goes. Uh, really, as far as weight damage goes, and I guess Scott can tell us probably because he's probably had to deal with it, but it's a it's a civil case right now, strictly civil. If you have, uh, you know, if you can you know, have reasonable belief and you think you can sue somebody for weight damage, that's right now that is your only option. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is. Uh, so I, just, okay. I asked that question, and I don't think I really maybe didn't come across. But the point is that they're under coal rigs. No, there's no speed limit. But if it's fo a foggy day, for instance, you can't, and you're driving at high speed, that's reckless navigation. So I'm saying, is is there a similar situation for wakes where there's no speed limit, but the wake is, I mean, on, on some level, it's, it could be regarded as reckless. Is that an interpretation of the coal rights, or, or that's not something you guys could envision? Civil. That'd be a civil interpretation. So yeah. Like, just like Captain McGovern said, and uh, you know, again, I mean, if, if it's foggy, they better have. If, if it's fog and the vessel's over a certain size, they better have their fog around. I mean, you know, wake and fog are not connected. So uh, it's a, it's a, um, we're taking three different parts and trying to connect them. So uh, uh, again, it just really go to, um, you know, if, if someone is waked, it's, it's really a, a civil issue. Because Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, there are rowing, rowing shells on a hollow river, uh, put in serious danger by wakes. Uh, uh, what, safe, uh, what state agency is in charge of enforcing wake-free zones? Um, and I could uh, say a little on this. Uh, in my past careers, I was at one time a captain of Circoin, so we did go up through the hollow river all the time. Uh, I have to tell you, all the captains at Circoin were very aware of the rowing shells when they were out there, and uh, all reduced speed. I don't know if anyone ever didn't. Uh, uh, in regard to wakes uh, by other vessels, I can't really speak to, but I think that's about the only commercial operator going up there now. Uh, so this would be primarily, uh, I was assume, I don't know who wrote the question, uh, recreational boats that are closing the wakes. So uh, how would uh, we answer this one? I'm going to ask you again, Linda. Who's the, it's a, it's a state regulation, and uh, we, we, we do actually have a shared responsibility with other uh, enforcement agencies on the water. So if uh, we, we are informed of, uh, of state law being broken, we work closely with, with NY, we're not only here locally with NYPD, because the only way so it is on the Harlem River, and I can tell you my two years in uh, my current position, if there had been uh, a wake zone complaint, we would have heard about it. Uh, if there had been a violation of the wake zone, we would have heard about it, and really I haven't heard anything about it. So
they say who has jurisdiction over Mars Canal and, uh, uh, and who would uh, enforce the existing laws on that location. So, uh, I don't know. Again, that's that's just, the subcommittee is doing that. I'm not exactly sure 
how they are doing that, but I was told that they're going to try to get that out to, to the different foreign users and the different marinas to get the, uh, that, that email address out there. But um, truthfully, I'm not exactly sure how they're doing it, but it was established so that there would be a quick um, route to get right in, and, and then it would, uh, I'm trying to think of, um, New Jersey DOT is then going to route that to the specific operator if they can find that it's, uh, as quickly as possible so that they can, they can fix whatever's wrong uh, as quickly as possible. I will find that out, but I'll, I'll get a hold of the chair of that, uh, that subcommittee. It's Staten Island Ferry Chairs the subcommittee, so I'll get a hold of them. Now, what Captain McGovern is referencing to is a Harbor Safety Committee. We have a lot of subcommittees. Uh, there's a Harbor Education Subcommittee. There's a Passion Vessel Subcommittee. And we all try to work our, you know, to collectively to make uh, you know, it a better place for everyone. Um, these are kind of uh, together here. And the one question is uh, Scott's comments about being better neighbors. How can we be better neighbors? How do we get the message out? Uh, uh, to the community to uh, be better neighbors. And I'm, the, the Harvest Safety Committee has done, uh, the Education Committee with Ray over there has done a lot with that in regard to uh, uh, the Harvest Safety video, right, Ray? Right. And uh, and uh, the second part to this, which is kind of together, is uh, you know how do we uh, protect our historic ships uh, like the John Harvey and, uh, uh, and marinas? And, and uh, I think this all goes back to uh, what we were saying earlier, which is to get the weight attenuation systems in, uh, especially in an area like this where it's nice and wide, uh, weight attenuation systems would work well. Uh, surge attenuation systems that Captain McGovern was referencing earlier would be more narrow channels like the Kilbane Cull, uh, and that would require you to have both surge and weight attenuation systems. But uh, uh, and uh, I don't know if anybody else would like to add to that, but uh, I think that's the answer to both of these questions, which would be uh, the weight attenuation systems. Uh, um, okay, so uh, here's another one. Uh, okay, uh, there are no wake zones, but uh, facilities, post sites facing the water say no wake, and some do. Uh, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, we have another question very similar. It says, how about areas such as construction sites and marinas and post no wake or low weight zones, is there any enforcement or just self-regulated? Um, it's self-regulated. Uh, if I can just give a little parallel, you take this waterway, it's, it's all you know federal waters, but then there's the navigable channel. Then you have areas, say, where we are right now, which is permitted both either by the state or the city to have a facility or a marina or a pier. Um, the facilities or marinas, if you put that in equivalent to um, you know going through a parking lot in a Target or something, um, you know, a lot of times you'll see parking lots saying, you know, reduce speed or, you know, slow down five miles an hour or put speed bumps in a, in a commercial parking lot. Um, it's, it's, it, I put that as equivalent to a, a recommended standard, but it is nothing, it isn't anything that the, uh, the local government or the federal government does enforce, but they are, they are a good idea if you are a construction company that is working on, under a bridge or on a facility or, you know, maybe you're going by a, a certain area that could be vulnerable. Um, it's just a more of a recommended standard and something that's enforceable. And, uh, the Coast Guard runs a, a vessel traffic service uh, for the commercial DFB over 300 tons in order to participate. Um, and if there is a, a temporary construction project or something, you know, Marina is obviously a permanent fixture, but if there's a temporary construction project that is requesting a, you know, a slow bell going by, then they will inform the, the vessel traffic service. The vessel traffic service will inform the uh, commercial vessels as they, as they approach that area. Uh, that's, you know, again, that's generally a temporary thing, you know, a couple of days, etc. cetera. Um, Permanent-wise, as, as the commander said, it's, uh, it's more of a suggestion than, um, uh, than a law. And, and truthfully, when you're on a commercial vessel and out, you know, halfway out the river, uh, and, you know, two miles up, you're not going to see a little no wake sign that's, uh, that's, you know, down here, that's, uh, that's, you know, a couple of feet by a couple of feet, because uh, it takes that long, you know, a commercial vessel uh, to slow it down, whether it's a tug and barge or a, or a ship, uh, it's going to take literally a couple of miles to slow down. Uh, that's, that's, you 
know, it's it's a it's it's momentum. I mean, it's it's a lot of a lot of a lot of weight. It just doesn't it doesn't stop. So uh, you know, that we um, as we're coming down the river, in the known marinas, uh, we do try to slow down more. Uh, but um, uh, the recreational craft. I mean, if you go over to the East River uh, by let's say you know, five o'clock on a nice Sunday afternoon. Uh, you'll see that river turning from, you know, a nice six-inch chop to probably about a six-foot confused chop. And it's, it's, it's all the recreational traffic that's running both ways through the river, uh, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. And it, it gets, it's, it's unbelievable by the, uh, by the end of the day. So, um, you know, these, uh, you know, a 50-foot boat or a 40-foot boat, uh, these non-planning hulls uh, throw, you know, one, one heck of a wake. Everyone just uh, you know, gets on and goes like this, and doesn't do this until they get to where they want to go. So it gets uh, it's pretty quick. All right, we have uh, two more questions, and uh, I'll do this one first. Uh, and I don't know if anyone here can answer this one. What role will climate change play in increasing or intensifying wake and surges? And what can be done to prepare? I don't, I don't think so. All right. This was Rawls' question. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and here's a, this is a good one. And uh, what can regulators do to improve our ability to build wake attenuations that work? And, uh, good afternoon. Come on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, as you can see, they are already working on some of this. It's the Institute, hopefully they'll come up with uh, some systems and, uh, you know, uh, much to, I'm sure, Scott's uh, uh, plea, they'll uh, not only uh, find out how to do it, but they'll get permits to, to place them in. Um, certainly that would uh, protect uh, our marinas uh, from uh, the weight damage. Uh, so uh, I think I've answered all the questions that were brought up. Uh, I hope I did. There were a lot of good questions here. Many times, it, you know, like I showed you before, it wasn't that tug and barge. It was that it was that little forty-foot recreational boat flying down the river. Just remember one thing: I get just as much damage in the winter that I do in the summer. So you can draw your own conclusion. Those are the ice boats. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say it. Um, and uh, well, yes. Uh, but, Ferries are, uh, you know, uh, we have, uh, that's, that's an, it's an issue. All right, um, so I think I'd like to uh, wrap this up. Is this good? All right. Uh, thank you again uh, to the MWA for organizing and uh, the Harvard Coalition for sponsoring this. And uh, uh, thank you very much.